we now understand how we connect with peripherals and the concept of memory mapping and what a bus is with its control data and address um, lines. And now we will go over to simple bus operation. So just a couple of words about that. How does communication work in general? First of all, we have two things. We have the inf interface and the protocol. The interface is the physical connection. It's the set of pins and wires that connect between the components. So that's really a, a, a definition of exactly which signals we have that make up the bus. The protocol is a set of rules for changing the logic le levels and meaning of data. So that's kind of the language that the different parts speak together. It's the process of what happens first, what happens next, and what is allowed and not allowed. Flow control is implemented to what we call handshaking. So you transfer data only when both the sender and the receiver are happy to receive. And we use what we call ACKS and NACKS for acknowledge or not acknowledge that um, tell us when we're ready. So uh, as we saw before, communication is convened between a master and a slave. And interfaces can be synchronous, which means they use a common clock that synchronizes between them, or they can be asynchronous, which means that they use some sort of clock domain crossing, or they use some sort of handshaking to ensure that really um, the data is ready. So what is this handshaking? Uh, handshaking protocol enables us to ensure that both um, devices are ready to communicate. So there are many types of uh, handshaking, but let's take a concept of what we call the four-cycle handshake. So first of all, the first device will have some sort of a, uh, of a signal that we'll call it an inquire signal. So the transmitter is going to ask the receiver if it's ready. And the, de the uh, second device, the device that is uh, going to be receiving, has an acknowledge signal, which um, says that it's ready to receive. So this four-cycle handshake process will be something like this. Um, here is time, and here is device one, the transmitting device, and here is device two, that's the receiving device. So device one will raise the inquire to initiate the transfer. Once device um, two accepts it and knows that and it says it's ready to, uh, to receive the, the transmission, it raises this acknowledge signal, signal. Then the transmission will start, will um, provide the action over here. Then device two will finish. It will lower its uh, acknowledge to say it's not ready anymore or it's finished with that. And then device one lowers the inquiry to say that the whole transmission has, has finished. Now, that's just a very conceptual type of a process. Um, it's actually done in different ways depending on the protocol. And sometimes these operations are integrated within other types of signals so we can save, uh, save uh, cycles and so forth. So we'll see that as we go into real buses. Just a word about bus arbitration. So we've uh, kind of looked at the fact that we have one master, and we'll usually be looking at that because it's a lot easier to conceptualize when we only have one master and many slaves. So, uh, But that's not the actual case. Usually, we will have many masters. Just in a multi-core system, for example, we'll have several CPUs. They'll each be masters. Or if we have a CPU and we have a DMA, which we'll learn about later, the DMA is another master. So there, there can be many masters on the bus. So if we have several masters on the bus, we have to have some way of deciding which one is the one that's taking control of the bus currently. And we have to also make sure that the right slave answers. So um, how do we do that? We do that with arbitration. So we have an arbiter, that's a controller piece over here, um, that each of the masters has some sort of a, a bus access logic, which usually includes a request line and a grant line. So um, the each of the masters will raise a request line and say, I want to transfer right now. They may do it all simultaneously, but it may be just only one. So obviously, if only one asks for a request, the arbiter will easily just grant them with the access, and then the bus can go on and take control over, uh, uh, the master can take uh, control over the bus. But what happens if we have several of these uh, masters who raise their hand at the same time and say they all want to talk? It's similar to being in a classroom where you know the master would be, say, the teacher, and the students will all raise their hands to talk, and then the teacher will have to point to one of them and say, this student talks first, and that student talks second. Otherwise, they all talk at the same time, and we have a lot of cacophony. So um, how do we do this? We use arbitration schemes. 
Um, so the arbiter has some sort of control logic inside that decides on how it's, it's going to resolve these conflicts between several masters wanting control of the bus. And um, just one of them, the simplest one, would just be to randomly select one of them. And that can often be actually useful. But um, uh, often we have priority-based uh, um, uh, arbitration schemes where one of the masters is more important or more urgent than the other, and it will get priority. The problem with that is if there are these, uh, pri these higher priority masters that keep getting priority, then you can cause starvation where the uh, lower priority master, uh, masters will never be able to uh, transfer their uh, to, to initiate their transfer. Um, so we have other types of more fair types of uh, arbitration schemes, such as round robin, where we go from one to the other, from one to the other, from one to the other, um, or time division multiplexing, where we have some sort of a cycle that goes around through time, and we just count time, and each of the masters has their own um, a unit of time where they're allowed to go out and transmit. So there are lots and different types of these arbitration schemes. Decoding is the, the other side where it decides uh, which uh, slave answers and so forth. It, it, when we um, go and uh, initiate a, 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 an op operation on the bus, um, the decoder actually tells the uh, slave which slave is being accessed. So it's another type of a unit that enables us to really um, select a slave versus having a comparator on each slave which looks at the bus all the time and decides if, it, if the transaction was going to them or not. So let's look at a typical bus operation example. And this is just uh, really something very simple and, uh, and conceptual. So we have the master or the manager and the slave or the subordinate over here. And the master, such as the processor, will select the slave by giving the address to the address bus. So it will send the address on the address bus. And again, either the slave will have some sort of comparator inside that will compare the address that's on the bus to their own address and say, OK, it's me. Or there will be a decoder that will send a, a personal select signal that will um, send the chip enable or something like that to the subordinate. At the same time, um, it sets the control signal, which will be such as a read enable, write enable, and will say what, our, what we're going to do, if we're going to read or we're going to write. It can have other things like what the transfer size is going to be and so forth in the control signals. Then um, the master sits there and waits while the slave does whatever operation it was told to do. And once the slave is ready, it's going to send back the requested data to the bus. So um, it also will probably send something like a ready signal on the control bus that says, OK, I finished my operation. Now I'm ready to receive another type of transmission. At that point, the master can finish you know, doing what it wants to do with uh, the data that it received and can initiate another type of a cycle, another transition. So let's see how that works with an actual bus. And what I'm going to use is the advanced peripheral bus, or better known as the APB, which is a simple low-performance bus. Um, APB is the simplest bus uh, that we have as part of the AMBA specification by ARM. AMBA is a very, very popular open uh, architecture of making buses that we'll be using um, just to discuss some of the uh, buses and how they can go in the next few slides. So APB uses uh, the following signals, and I'm going to show an APB bridge. Remember, a bridge has a slave on one side and a master on the other side, just to show all the signals that go into here. So we have these general signals that go both into the master and slave that are the clock and the reset. And all of the APB, thanks to the P over here, have a P in their name. So P clock and P reset N, because it's an active low signal. Uh, it has the N. They are general. They'll go both into the master and slave to make us have a synchronous, resettable bus. Um, then we have the master side. These are the ones in green. So we have P address, um, which is the 32-bit address um, to select the one of the uh, slaves. We have um, the, the P write data, which will be the 32-bit the write data that we want to put on the bus. Um, we have the uh, uh, P write, which is the write enable, which tells us if there is a write or a read. And we have these uh, select the P select signals. So in APB, each and every one of the um, of the slaves has a single select signal. And so I don't use a decoder. I basically, or, or I can send this through a decoder, but I basically um, send one signal um, that is saying, OK, I'm selecting you. You're the one that is supposed to be turned on right now. So each and every one of these get routed one P select signal. And P enable will uh, in indicate the second cycle of an APB transfer, as we'll see in a moment. 
On the other side, which is the slave side, or the incoming, uh, um, uh, the, the data that comes back to the master, we have the PR data, which is the read data. So if there was a read operation and the slave uh, returns uh, the, the read data, it's a 32-bit bus over here. We have an error, uh, an error signal that we're not going to discuss. And we have a ready signal, which is uh, for giving the act. So it's similar to the select signal. The ready signal will tell us if uh, we're ready to accept the transfer and it will be used to initiate a wait state. So let's see how this works. So we have the master over here and two slaves, and here are the, um, the uh, signals that they have. You can see the directions. They're going to be exactly uh, symmetric between the master and the slave. So we have our peak clock signal, and we're going to have three cycles over here running. So during the first uh, uh, cycle over here that we have, we have what we call the setup phase. And in the setup phase, the P write, P address, and P data signals are set. So we're saying over here that we're going to have a write operation by raising P write. Um, and in, in sometime during the cycle, we set the address on the address bus, on the P address bus, and the data on the P data bus. Then we go and we select the slave. So we want to write to slave one. So we will only raise P cell of slave one. We will keep P cell of slave lo uh, two low. And uh, so far, we'll keep enable low. And in the meantime, the slaves, they don't do anything. The data bus is not driven. And um, the ready signals of each of the slaves are not driven to anywhere. OK, uh, then we have, the, after the rising edge, basically, the, um, the certain slave is selected. The address and data are written into the, the slave that is selected. And then we have what we call the access phase, where the actual operation is done. At this point, the enable signal is driven by the master. So that says, OK, go and do the operation. Um, uh, the other signals are just kept the same as they were before. Okay, and once the, the operation is, um, is done by the slave, the slave raises the ready signal, which is actually its type of an act. That means, okay, I finished the operation. Um, the other, the, obviously, the P ready signal from the other slave stays low, and the P data signal is also not driven because um, it, this is a right operation. Okay, so if uh, we want to extend the right, uh, the, 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 to extend it, then the ready signal will be kept low until we kind of want to act and then leave it up. Once uh, the, this P ready has gone up, the, uh, the master can understand that it's free to go and do a second transition, and therefore it will change the address and data during the next uh, uh, clock cycle. Okay, and it can change its select to a different slave, for example. Um, and uh, it has to bring down P enable because enable is only on the next setup phase, which will be the next clock cycle. Okay, um, uh, so that is a write transfer. And let's see a read transfer, which is very similar. So again, we have a setup phase, which is going to be the first clock cycle, and we're going to take P write and put it down. So a low P write means we're doing a read, um, and we're going to set the address. We do not drive the data because obviously we're now asking for a read of this address, not to write certain data to the address. Then we again select one of the slaves, okay, and we keep enable low while the slave so far does not answer or do anything. During the second cycle, what we do is we keep all of those signals stable, okay? But we raise the P enable signal, which says to the slave uh, that was selected before, go and do your thing. So what the slave is going to do, it's going to take its time, and it's going to provide the data out on the uh, PR data bus. And it's also going to say ready, which means that the data is now driven. It's an act to say, okay, I finished my operation. You can go and take it. Um, once that is finished, and again, it can... Keep P ready low to extend that. Once it's finished, now the, um, the master can change to a different address, um, lowering P enable, changing P select, and so forth. And, uh, uh, and the PR data will be driven off of the uh, data bus, and P ready will go low. So that is the simple APB read and write uh, um, transfers. And we can see how the acts are kind of uh, um, uh, hidden into there with the P ready signal and just the different accesses. So just to see a state diagram of this, which you can go and easily implement in Verilog. And there's uh, an example here that I found, which was kind of nice by Quick Silicon. So you can click on this link and, uh, 
and go and see how they did it in, in Verilog. So what we have is a three uh, state state machine. In the first state, we're at idle. Um, we go uh, at the first clock cycle to the setup phase. And in the setup phase, we set the select uh, that we want to select, but we keep P enable low. And we stay in this setup phase only for one clock cycle. During the next cycle, we go over to the access sta uh, state where we raise the P enable while not changing the P select. So, and then we again stay here for one cycle. However, there is uh, the option where the slave will keep P ready low. And in this case, we stay in this access phase until P ready is actually um, high, which uh, will bring us uh, an ACK and enable us to finish the operation.